As we get closer to the Academy Awards, everyone is talking about the little film that could, The Cider House Rules. In 1986, author John Irvin began to adapt his award-winning novel into a screenplay. After numerous rewrites, he met director Lars Hallstrom, and the film finally went into production. Released this past December, it has garnered much critical acclaim. It has been nominated for seven Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Joining me now, the author and screenwriter John Irving and director Lars Hallstrom. I am pleased to have them here. Lars is known for such critical acclaim films as My Life as a Dog and What's Eating Gilbert Gray. Welcome to both of you. Great to have Thank you, you back. Great to Thank have you on the program. Thank you. Um, this began with your novel. Did you write this knowing, thinking that of all the novels you have written, some have been made into movies, it would be the most likely, in your judgment, to make a film from? It was the most likely in, in, in my judgment in that I could visualize it, I could see it. I had declined uh, invitations from George Roy Hill and Tony Richardson to write screenplays of The World According to Garp in the Hotel New Hampshire. I just couldn't see them uh, as films, although I liked Even the films. Even though they were that, made in films. They, I liked the films that George and, and Tony made, but I was detached from them. In, in this case, the, the symmetry of the story, uh, that it comes back where it begins. It begins in an orphanage, boy leaves the orphanage for good reason, for better reason, comes back to the orphanage. It had a, a circular, uh, it was a circular story, I thought that would work in, in the compression of, of film time. And also, I'd done all of the medical history uh, research necessary for the novel, and I didn't think that uh, Lhasa or another director would likely find a retired obstetrician gynecologist who was writing screenplays in his spare time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened? I mean, the studio bought it. No. Right. What happened? No, I didn't sell it. Um, you didn't sell it? No, I, I, I held out for that un unusual, uh, hopeful thing that, um, that there would be a producer who wanted to make the picture and a director who wanted to uh, work with that producer and me and that the three of us um, would have an agreement uh, that we would agree about the creative decisions involved in the film. And Richard Gladstein, the producer, uh, subscribed to that, and Lhasa agreed to that, and, and we, um, we didn't have any fights, did we? None? No, we no big fights? We didn't know, no, not no. even so small ones. You, no. you agreed on, the, on the, what the film ought to be about, the concept, the sense of how you compress this novel into this movie? That was pretty much, yeah, maybe you liked the screenplay? I did. Maybe <laughs> John picked up on my fear of conflict, I don't know, but we had a wonderful time. Your fear of conflict? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a wonderful collaboration here, and um, yeah. um, it's been a very collaborative effort. And was he on set as well as writing the screenplay, so that he was there in case you, we needed to make some changes? Maybe. Yeah, I was not on set. Mm -hmm. I don't think writers are very valuable on the e set. Even if it's a screenwriter? I don't think so. Really? I, I think if, if we did our homework, I think before, before, mm -hmm. and and I was happy to, you know, contribute notes while he was editing the did, the, the film. Did you get involved in the casting? Well, only that um, I approved of everyone. You know, I mean, I thought everyone was a good choice. Boy, Michael Caine is perfect for this, isn't, isn't he? he? Yeah. I mean, was that was he the only choice? Mm, no, he is the only choice. He's, he was. I Maybe mean, you would just say that. Choice. I mean, no. he, he really inhabits in, in my eye. After having seen Little Voice, I saw dailies from Little Voice. Yeah. Yeah. He really fit the part. He has the authority and the intelligence and the, the wit. And he's just inhabiting this part. There's no switching on or off for him. It's just a very off and casual approach to acting, a very low-key approach to acting. It's just a wonderful learning experience to watch him work. All right, roll tape. This is the first clip we'll see. This is where Michael Caine puts the orphans to bed in the orphanage that he runs. He is Dr. Large. Take a look. Why does Dr. Lurch say that every night? Maybe to scare us. Does it because we like it? Do you like it, Curly? Yeah. I like it, too. John, where does this story come from? Well, 20 years ago, I, I thought of a relationship between an orphanage physician and an unadopted uh, orphan. Uh, and I went to Yale Medical Historical Library and began to read about uh, orphanage uh, facilities, orphanage hospitals, and uh, without um, the intention of writing about the uh, abortion subject, uh, there it was, uh, that, that procedure, performing it or not, illegally uh, in those years, 
was inseparable with the life of an, an orphanage uh, uh, hospital because uh, if any doctor would have sympathy uh, for those women leaving those children behind and more importantly for those children who in so many cases would never be adopted uh, it would be a physician in an orphanage facility and so uh, in a way the principal conflict between this surrogate father surrogate son uh, presented itself uh, to me out of um, you know the history of the period there's an orphanage near my hometown. I live in Henderson. There's an orphanage in Oxford, North Carolina. And I used to always want to, I mean, I wonder what it was like, because, I mean, the, the physical place is to, you know, the aspirations that those kids would go through when somebody would come, maybe to select them, mm -hmm. and maybe not. The whole sheer, you know, mm -hmm. drama of that and, and pain that it comes from. When we first met, one of the concerns... Anyway, your, your movie made me think about that. Yeah. It, well, it, to, to speak to that, w one of the things that, that Lasso was concerned about in the script when we first met, and, and, and I hadn't found a way to do this, was that uh, the novel takes place over a 15-year period of time. That orphan is away from the orphanage for, for 15 years, and so the emotional impact of him coming back... Um, is by the weight of those years huge and I had reduced uh, the period of time he's away to less than a year um, and and loss of uh, saw a way to extend that to at least uh, two years and to and, and to reinstate something of what you called the the epic, epic uh, scope of the story we uh, reinstated I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but one of the things that that we gained emotionally I had never foresaw until I saw the first rough cut of the film that, that he showed me which is to have that orphan come back to the orphanage to become the abortionist, the orphanage physician. In the movie, in a way, emotionally, it's stronger because he comes back to the same orphans yes, who yes, were yes. there when he left. Right, right. And you make the point by seeing them that they haven't been uh, adopted, that like him, they're unadopted. And uh, it, it, it was a, a plus I didn't see in, in the screenplay on the page. I didn't see it un, un, until uh, Lasse showed me the rough cut. Roll tape. This is another scene, just to give you some of the other actors. Toby Maguire here plays doc, tells Dr. Large that, that he's leaving. This is the, the, the departure that we talked about and the return. Here it is. There's no taking care of anybody. Not out there. You know, I'm grateful for everything that you've done for me. I don't need your gratitude. I don't need this. I know all about my condition. It's your heart. Casting. Mm -hmm. Tobey Maguire. Uh -huh. He was here the other day because he's in a new film also with Michael Douglas. Yes. He's a terrific young man. He's wonderful. Another actor who, who knows how to understate, or, or state rather, because there's so much overstating <laughs> yeah. uh, in movies these days. So he's really uh, running along with Michael Caine. They have the same approach to acting. It's uh, the understatement. Mm. That is the most important to them. Uh, so he, he's another uh, actor who can inhabit the part. He's present emotionally in every scene. He trusts the fact that that is enough to convey what needs to be conveyed. Shirley Theron. Mm, uh, uh, a life force. Um, had a lot of great ideas on our script, actually, really? that we included. Like, yes. you mean specific like for her involve, character or specific for her for character, for, oh, for, for her the character. love story? Yeah. I like to involve um, actors on every level of of um, the aspect of film. You respect actors? Yes, I do. Uh, my first duty, I think, as director is to make sure that actors can flourish and do their best. And so I encourage improvisation and contributions on all levels. Take a look at this clip uh, involving Toby and Charlie's roll tape. And then, give me your arm. Put your arm around me. Just cuddle and hug and, you know, you don't really watch the movie. I would watch the movie. What would it mean to you to win an Academy Award? Uh, a fantastic honor, getting films actually financed and made, which has been a tough thing for me the last couple of years. Um, I had a movie made four years ago before this one. So, and in between, I've been working on stories that never happened because of financial problems. So maybe I'll get out of those problems. I don't know. That would be the wonderful reward, I think. Have a chance to do it again. 
Yes. It's true, isn't it? It is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's what most people would say. Yeah. Just the being able to work back to work. most about being recognized for my work is to be able to do it again because uh -huh. the joy of doing it is so uh -huh. Being able to work back to back without pausing yeah. for financial about, mysteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck, John. Thank you. Pleasure to have you back. Thanks. We'll be right back. Stay with us.